Well, good afternoon or good evening, uh, whatever the case may be where you are. Uh, my name is Mark Mamagonian. I'm the Director of Academic Affairs for the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. I want to thank you all for joining us today for perspectives on the Armenian Iranian photographer Anton Sevrugin, a conversation. I also want, in particular, to thank the co sponsoring organizations of today's event, the Arat Eskijan Museum and its director, Maggie Mangasarian Goshen, and the Society for Armenian Studies and its president, Bedros Dermatosian. Both of these organizations and both of those individuals are among our most steadfast collaborators on programs, and we are truly grateful for their interest, for their support, and for their uh, collegiality. After tonight, we will take a little breather from programs, but, but fear not, it will not be a long breather and we will be back soon. Uh, a reminder to all those who are joining us tonight on Zoom that you can submit questions for the speakers using the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we will try to get to as many of those as possible. As ever, we ask you to keep them short and on on topic. Um, in early 2020, I was contacted by one of our speakers tonight, Dr. Tasha Vorderstrasse, about what was to be a forthcoming exhibition on the photography of Antoine Sevrugin at the, at the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago and about the accompanying catalog. Uh, this led to her submitting a grant proposal and later a grant being issued from, the, from Nasser and the Knights of Vartan Fund for Armenian Studies in support of the publication of the catalog. And I'm very happy to be able to hold up a copy uh, of this beautiful catalog that has been published. Uh, and, and I would urge you all to check it out. It is available from the Nasser Bookstore and uh, undoubtedly from other uh, online bookstores as well. And maybe if there are any in-person bookstores at this point, it's available there too. Uh, at this point, I don't probably don't have to explain to you that the exhibition itself was delayed uh, that was going to take place last year until this year. Uh, but regardless, we're very pleased to have been able to provide support for this very valuable work and tonight to bring together three of the scholars who contributed to the volume to discuss various aspects of Severgin's work. I'd like to just give brief introductions to our, our three speakers in, in alphabetical order. Carissa Johnson is Managing Editor of Publications at the, Orient, at the Oriental Institute. With a love for art, detail, people, ancient history, and the written word, she's worked as a licensed counselor, receiving her master's in counseling in 2013, and a photographer as well as an editor. She has been a professional photographer for over 15 years, providing portrait wedding, newborn ballet, and family photography. She continues to photograph part-time in addition to her editorial work at the Oriental Institute and enjoys the way both mediums incorporate design elements, enhance one's living, and tell individual and collective stories. Paulina Kassian is currently serving as Assistant Director of Development and Events at the Oriental Institute. She received her Diploma in History of Russian Art from St. Petersburg State University and her Master's in Art History and Humanities from the European, Insti European University at St. Petersburg, Department of Art History. Her area of research includes ancient Russian art and architecture, the national movement in Russian art and architecture of the 19th century, and the reception of Western architecture in the late Soviet period. In 2019, she co-taught a class with Tasha Vorderstrasse entitled Imagining Central Asia, which examined the Russian perception and depiction of Central Asia from the early 18th century to Soviet times. And Dr. Tasha Vorderstrasse is the University and Continuing Education Program Coordinator at the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. She received her PhD in Near Eastern Archaeology from the University of Chicago. Her work focuses on the material culture of the Middle East and Northern Africa, the South Caucasus and Central Asia, and the relationships between these regions and with China, which covers a good portion of the globe, I, I might point out. Uh, she has done archaeological fieldwork throughout the Middle East and was the co-director of the Oriental Institute excavations at Ambroi in Armenia. She has also led two Oriental Institute trips to Armenia and Georgia, 
and she is currently curating the Oriental Institute special exhibition, Antoine Sevrugain, Past and Present, which you can see either virtually through their website or attend in person on a limited basis. This exhibition will be on throughout this year, and you can also download uh, a PDF of the catalog book, which I will again hold up for, for visual purposes, which she edited. Uh, it's online. The PDF can be downloaded free, um, which is fantastic. Uh, it's also nice. The physical object of the book is also a wonderful thing. It feels nice in your hands, and it, and it looks really nice when you open it up. So uh, I would encourage you to to get both media in your in your hands uh, as soon as possible. So I will now turn it over to our speakers, who I once again want to thank for for joining us for this special event, which I'm very excited about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. So I'm going to now share my screen, which will hopefully work. Uh, hang on, let me just, right. okay. And hopefully everyone can see that fine with no problem. So uh, I would first like to start um, before we begin um, by thanking uh, Nasser and uh, particularly uh, Mark Mamagonian for this invitation. It's really a wonderful opportunity for us to present to you what we've been doing with the catalog and the aspects of the catalog that I particularly thought would be interesting to focus on uh, this evening. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Paulina Cassian and Carissa Johnson for uh, appearing with me to talk about this. Of course, we spent a lot of time talking about this. So it's also a great opportunity for us to, to, to talk about it some more. Um, so as, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, on the 1st of April, 2021, uh, the exhibition Antoine Severgain Past and Present uh, opened at the Oriental Institute. This is a picture of it you can see uh, of the opening uh, part of the exhibition. Uh, we were very fortunate that we were able to uh, put this exhibition on, uh, despite the fact, obviously, that as we know, the uh, world situation meant that the exhibition was somewhat uh, delayed. The exhibition itself consists of a selection of uh, reproduction, primarily reproduction photographs from the OI collection of photographs uh, from the late 19th century, most of which are by Antoine Severgin. There's 153 of these photographs in total. And in addition, some of the original photographs were also put on display. So this really gives you an opportunity then to see some of our collection. But of course, the majority of the photographs, and in fact, all of them ended up being published in the accompanying catalog. And it was this catalog that really helped me sort of start to think about what it was I wanted to do in the exhibition. And that that was really to uh, approach Severgain from a very specific point of view. So as Mark pointed out, here's the catalog itself. And Carissa Johnson, who is the head of publications at the OI, was really instrumental in helping lay out the photographs, lay out the entire book. And of course, also put together the cover of the catalog, which you can see here, uh, where basically we drew upon the uh, signatures of Antoine Severgin on the backs uh, or even the fronts, as we'll see, of many of his photographs. And we're able to produce what I thought was really a beautiful volume that sort of exemplified uh, late 19th century photography, specifically 19th century uh, Iranian photography, which of course is what Severgin um, was doing. So one of the things I wanted to do as part of the catalog was to really look at parts of Severgin's biography, parts of his work, which hadn't necessarily been explored in as much uh, detail. So because those of you who are familiar with the work of Antoine Severgin, who is, you know, whose biography we'll get to in a moment, but those of you who know it will know that his work has been studied quite extensively, particularly starting in the late 1990s. And he's been the subject of several exhibitions or certainly part of several exhibitions, particularly several which have happened in recent years. So the question was, how could we look at this in new and hopefully different and exciting ways? And then how could we put that into a catalog that people would enjoy reading in addition to looking at all 153 pictures? Because that was one of the things I wanted to make sure that the catalog had was all of the photographs in the OI collection. So as a result of this, uh, I was very lucky that many, we have many talented people at the Oriental Institute. So we're very fortunate to have a very deep pool of expertise upon which to draw in various different aspects. And one of the first things I wanted to do was understand when Severgin was 
as a child and as a young adult living in the South Caucasus, specifically in what is now Georgia, but was of course at the time part of the Russian empire, how does his studying art, Russian art in Georgia inform what he did when he went back to Iran and became a photographer? So it was one of these things where uh, I knew because of, I'd worked with her before that Paulina was an expert in this. So I invited her to become part of the catalog and contribute. And equally, I was interested in looking at photography as such. So I'm not a photographer. I'm not a professional photographer, right? I can hold an iPhone and photograph as easily as the next person, probably not very well, but I didn't, don't have that eye, right? I'm not a professional photographer. And I thought it was really important to have a professional photographer understand what Severgeen's trying to do, because I hope as we proceed through these pictures, you'll see what an amazing photographer he is. Now, I should mention, of course, that Armenian photographers were, uh, you know, there was a huge number of Armenian photographers working in the Ottoman Empire, in the Russian Empire, as well as in, the, in Qajar, Iran. So, Severgin is one of this you know, vast number of individuals, but as we'll see, he had a very specific vision, which I think makes him really special, although perhaps I am biased. So what we're gonna do this evening is we're gonna go through a little bit of background where um, both Paulina and Carissa will talk a little bit about what it was they were trying to do. And then we'll look specifically at some of the different genres of photography that Antoine Severgin did in order to sort of understand. And I hope at the end of this, you will have a greater appreciation for quite frankly, what a genius, I mean, really, uh, Antoine Severgin was, and it's not a word I use lightly, but I think, yeah, his work still speaks to us and inspires us today. So just a brief uh, biography to situate us. Um, Antoine Severgin was born approximately in 1851. People used to think it was 1830s, but then Stacey Scheibler, I think, has effectively argued through her research that it was later. And he was born in Tehran, uh, on the grounds of the Russian embassy. So I, one might have expected that as an Armenian living uh, in Iran, where as we know, there's a large uh, Armenian population, uh, that he would be part of the Ar Armenian Iranian community in Iran. But his family actually came from the Russian empire. His father was a Russian diplomat. So when he was quite young, his father died and his mother returned with the family to uh, first to Tbilisi or what was known at the time as Tiflis in what is now Georgia. Um, and then apparently it became too expensive to live there. And so they moved to what may have been his mother's hometown potentially, or at least a town she had a close association with. And that is the town of Abulis, which is now in uh, Nakhchivan in modern Azerbaijan. Then he lived in Agulis, uh, and then after that, uh, went back to Tbilisi and started to study art with Dmitry Ermakov uh, before in the 1870s, going back to Iran, setting up first a studio in Tabriz, but then ultimately in Tehran, uh, where he achieved great success, became a uh, court photographer to the uh, Shah of Iran, and interestingly married a member of the Armenian Iranian community. Uh, so he married back into the community uh, and lived the rest of his life uh, in uh, Tehran. The photographs in the Oriental Institute collection, which we'll see a lot of examples of here, were acquired in the 1890s by an American Protestant missionary and donated to the Oriental Institute, which wasn't actually yet the Oriental Institute in 1901. So Paulina, if you want to perhaps say a few things about your research and what it was that you were doing. Absolutely, thank you, Dasha. Natasha first told me about her plans to do an exhibition on Tuan Subrugin. All of us at Doai, I was intrigued by his multinational identity. This mixed identity of Russian Armenian who was born in Persia and raised in Georgia, which was a part of the Russian Empire at the time, definitely affected his career path and even an artistic point of view. Next slide, please. So Natasha asked me if I think there is a potential connection between his photography and the Russian art of the 19th century. I was excited to write an article for her catalog which would demonstrate that there is indeed a connection and that Sivrugin art could be placed in this context. Next slide, please. As Stasha already mentioned, Anton Sivrugin was born in a Russian embassy in Tehran in the family of Vasily Sivrugin and Achin Kanu. 
After the Second Russian-Persian War, the Russian Empire gained control over a large territory of the Caucasus, including Eastern Georgia, Dagestan, Armenia, and other areas mostly located between the Black and Caspian Seas. A politically unstable but strategically important area with access to two seas and control over several important trading routes. In 1844, Tbilisi became the capital of Caucasus by royalty, controlled by the governor general appointed by the Russian Tsar himself. The important role of Tbilisi in the region and its strong connection with St. Petersburg provided for rapid industrial and commercial development in the city and the steady population growth. In addition to the local Georgians and a large Armenian community, the presence of Russian state officials, officers, troops, clerks, and their families meant that the city had a sizable Russian population as well. Next slide, please. By the time then Belisi So sorry. <laughs> By the time when Tbilisi became the capital of Caucasus by royalty and the home of the governor general residency, the Russian Empire, Empire controlled much of the region and despite of a number of continuous military conflicts, began to change its strategy from military conquest to the establishment of cultural policies. Those policies included the development of extensive network of Russian schools, the incorporation of Russian language in state institution, the spread of orthodoxy as the main religion, and the foundation of various cultural institutions. Those cultural institutions shaped the Lisi cultural life in the second half of the 19th century, and we pose it in the catalog article, strongly affected the development of Anton Sigurgin's career in art and photography. Anton Sibrugin likely moved to Tbilisi to study art in the late 60s or early 70s. By the time, a rapid growth of the city population and financial stabilities created a favorable environment for the development of the art scene. Artistic life in Tbilisi during those times was just beginning to take shape under the influence of the cultural life in St. Petersburg. Russian officer and state official brought with them contemporary cultural trends in arts and Russian artists who could meet those tastes. While there are not any specialized art school in Belicia until 1873, the city had a healthy art community, which consisted of mostly Russian, Armenian, and Georgian artists who graduated from rather the Imperial Academy of Art in St. Petersburg or the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture. Most of them were sent to the Caucasus for military or state jobs. In addition to their work on state expedition projects, many of them taught art at local school, a gymnasium, or conducted private lessons. Those any informal art education received by Antoine Sivrugin and Belisi in the early 70s would have likely been based on a tradition of Russian academic art. Next slide, please. According to the biographers of Anton Sivrugin, we know that shortly after moving to Belisi, he met the local photographer Dmitry Rmakov, who became his mentor. Dmitry Rmakov was born in Belisi in 1846 or 48. In 1860, he graduated from classes organized by the local military topographic department, where he studied topography and the photography as a part of his topographic training. By the end of the 60s, he was actively involved in a number of archaeological, ethnological, and geographical expeditions in the region. In addition to that, he was working on the catalogs of the archaeological collection in the Museum of Caucasus in Belisi. Next slide, please. Following his studies, Yermakov opened his first studio of photo portraits together with Russian artist Peter Kolchin in the center of Tbilisi. Unfortunately, the details about Peter Kolchin's life are largely unknown to us. We know that he was born around 1838, and in 1855, he enrolled in the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture. Next slide, please. In 1864, he submitted one of his paintings to the Imperial Academy of Art and was awarded with a small silver medal, recognizing him as a specialist in portraits paintings. The award provided Colchin with the status of free artist, and sometimes in the middle of the 60s, he moved to Tbilisi. Over the next few years, he met Dmitry Makov, and together they opened the photo studio, Photography by Artist Colchin and Yermakov. This collaboration between the military topographer and the portraitist played an important role in development of the photo style of Yermakov and likely later influenced Sibrunia as well. Right. So perhaps, Carissa, now that we've sort of gotten a sense of where he got his inspiration for his photography, once he went to uh, back to Iran and opened up his photo studio, maybe you can talk a little bit about the technology he would have employed and what he would have been doing. And also, you know, I, I referred to Severgin earlier as a genius. What, what does that actually mean from a photographic point of view? Thank you, Tasha. I 
I'm so excited to be here with you all, and I would love to talk about Severgeen. Studying him and spending a lot of time on this catalog has been really inspiring, and I really appreciate his work. So I'll be speaking briefly about the photographic technology that he used, primarily his camera, the type of printing that he did, as well as the techniques that he employed, primarily lighting and composition. So to start off, this is probably the type of camera that he would have used. It's a wide format camera. During Severgeen's time, photographs were produced by coating a glass plate with light sensitive chemicals and then placing that at the back of the camera, which you can see on the left, um, and exposing it to light. This would create a negative image, which you could then use to generate multiple prints on light sensitive paper. Exposures could take several minutes depending upon how bright it was, which is important to note because as you look through Severgeen's portraits, I see people who were probably posing for one or two minutes, but still look relaxed or active or engaged rather than stiff, which is incredibly hard to accomplish and speaks to his skill. We can move to the next slide, please. We have a few photographs of his camera. Uh, here is one that he took to a monument and it's important to keep in mind that he would have had to have taken the glass plates, the chemicals, the tripod and the camera all on horseback to locations like these. And you can see his camera there with a uh, dark cloth over it. Next slide, please. Here's another image that Tasha found of him captured in the reflection of a mirror standing next to his camera, which is kind of interesting. And the next slide, please. And one more of him with his camera. You can see him in the foreground in the shadows with the dark cloth over the camera next to another person. Um, moving on to the type of printing that he did, once he'd received or once he'd completed taking the glass plate negative, he would have used a term album and printing at the time was popular. This was accomplished by coating thin pieces of paper with an egg white or albumin and sodium chloride or a salt wash coating the paper with this, which would create kind of a glossy texture to it as well as and do it with the necessary chemicals. After drying, the paper would then be treated with another wash, this time with silver nitrate to make it light sensitive. And then he would then have those papers ready to place underneath the glass plate, exposing the paper to light for anywhere from a couple minutes to up to an hour, depending upon how um, bright he wanted that exposure to be. This would create a print, which was fairly cheap to reproduce and easy to distribute and sell. And Albumin, I'll note, yellows as it ages, which is why so many of his photographs have a yellowish hue to them. Next slide, please. The flash for camera wasn't invented until the late 1880s. So Severgeen, as well as other photographers and painters during the time, would have had a studio that probably looked something like this with a large north facing window allowing for a lot of steady lighting throughout the day. Next slide, please. Lighting, uh, moving on to some of his photographic techniques that he used, lighting I'm just amazed at how he handles lighting in his photographs. He was a genius. Uh, photography itself comes from the Greek drawing with light. And he, he used light so well to create uh, intimate and striking uh, positions and, and composures. And I'm gonna go through just a couple of his lighting techniques. The first one is called Rembrandt lighting, which is so-called because of the way artists were inspired by the way Rembrandt Brandt painted light on faces. And the way that uh, you accomplish Rembrandt lighting is to make sure that your source light is somewhere above the subject facing down uh, and that it creates enough light on one side of the face to illuminate one side. And then on the shadowed side would create a small uh, triangle of light. This creates a lot of depth with a person's face, it, it creates um, interest, it creates dimension. And this is something that he used both in studio and outdoors. Next slide. Outdoor lighting would have been incredibly difficult for Severgin because he's at the mercy of the elements and he doesn't have any artificial lighting. And I am just shocked going through his photographs at how he both diminishes shadows in a way that adds to a composition or uses them to add to the composition. And on the right, you'll see there aren't really any shadows. There's not a lot of contrast 
Often when shooting outside, you're trying to avoid contrasting shadows across a subject's face. And all of the faces in that photograph are well lit. There's detail. The background is also not uh, blown out or overexposed. So you, you're aware of all, of all of the details and the details are allowed to really speak to the composition of, of the photo. He probably would have taken this photo it looks like the shadows speak to maybe a high noon photograph, but that it was during a cloudy day um, in order to get that diffused light. And then on the left, you can see how he's using both the darks and the lights in shadows to add to the composition and create kind of a 3D dimensional effect uh, with the group of people that is moving towards the monument. This is a technique using darks and lights to create a three-dimensional effect is uh, called Kiro, Kiro and uh, he used it incredibly well. Uh, besides lighting, moving on to the next slide, there are a couple other ways that he composed his photographs that really speak to his expertise. One of them is what we call in photography, filling the frame. And uh, the photograph on the left was taken by Severgin and the one on the right was not. And you'll notice just the incredible difference between these two photographs. On the left, I'm drawn in. I have to reckon with this person's story and I'm curious about who they are. Um, filling the frame means that you use positive space or negative space to let everything within that composition add to the story of that photo. So there's nothing in that composition that's going to detract from the overall story of the photo or take away from the focus. And he's cropped the photo so close around this, this uh, person's outline. Some of the clothing even on the edge is cropped out of the image, but it, it really allows you to just be drawn in and reckon with his face. The chains at the bottom are secondary to the picture. Whereas on the right, you're really struck with, oh, this is a, a prisoner, an accessory. There's a, a guard. There's a lot of negative space, the, the absence of, of content um, around both of these characters. And it kind of detracts from the overall um, power or uh, the story of what could be conveyed as, as we see Severgin doing so well on the left. Moving on to the next. Severgin, again, this is a good example of his use of negative space and using it to talk about um, or to add to the story of the subject. All of this vastness in the background uh, is adding to the story of the two subjects in the, in the foreground. And another tool that he, compositional tool that he used was the rule of thirds, which in photography, it's, it's where you divide an image into nine equal parts by imaginary horizontal and vertical lines, and then place the most important focal point at an intersection of those two lines. Rather than placing the focal point in the center, placing it on one of these, one of these uh, converging lines allows your eye to spend more time in the photograph and travel through the photograph. One great way to pay attention to what's important in a photograph is to pay attention to where your eye goes first and how it travels through a photograph. If you spend a lot, a lot of time traveling through the photograph, you know that there's a lot of compositional tools used to create a lot of interest and um, dynamic uh, emotion and to generate that. So. Uh, he uses the, the rule of thirds really well in so many of his, his works. Moving on to the next. Another compositional tool that he uses is leading lines. These are lines created by subjects or props or even implied lines that help create specific paths for a viewer's eye to travel through a composition. On the right, you can see the literal uh, diagonal lines that converge toward one of those focal points of the rule of thirds, um, creating some, some interesting dynamic there to maybe a monument that wouldn't be as interesting to the eye if there wasn't some movement within that composition. And then on the left, I love how Severgin reveals by obscuring and a lot of photographers would place subjects in a way that you can see their full face, their front on towards the camera. He obscures so often and so artfully with his subjects, the, the, um, girl on the left is obscuring her face with her arm and creating a triangle with her elbow as well as the jar that she's holding. And that's creating, it's pointing to an imaginary leading line that goes towards the subject on the right, who is the only subject who's looking directly into the camera. So it's creating some interesting movement between um, focal points within this image. And you can see a bit of the imaginary lines as well as the, the uh, actual lines that are there. 
on to the next slide. One final compositional tool that I'll talk about is his use of, of props, which there's a whole discussion there um, regarding how his use of props speaks to the identity of the subjects involved. And uh, that could be a whole nother topic in and of itself. But I just want to note slightly how he used these props in a way that artfully still draws a viewer into this photograph. The immediate focal point is the man's face on the left. Um, and from there, the staff that he's holding draws your eye over to the woman on the right, the uh, animal skin, the tail that goes down her body, your eye is then drawn down to her foot, then drawn to the bottom of the cane, back up to her hand, back up across the man's uh, arm to the staff, and continues to kind of just travel through this image. So it's there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of um, dynamic, there's a a lot of beautiful lighting and a lot of compositional techniques that he uses that I'll allude to some of these as we go through uh, photos later on, but this just kind of gives you an idea of the technology and the techniques that he employed. Thank you, Carissa. I mean, I think one of the things that really strikes me with Severgeen is that he is following a lot of the same genre, types of genre pictures that other photographers were taking in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And a lot of this material was to supply the market for, for example, uh, tourists who would come to the Middle East and uh, North Africa, for example, particularly uh, in the Ottoman Empire, um, and would buy pictures of we'll see monuments and things like this, but also wanted to buy pictures of various ethnic uh, and religious groups. And Severgin is doing this too. A lot of these pictures were purchased by um, uh, tourists or people who lived uh, in Iran and then came back uh, to uh, North America and uh, Europe. Um, and, you know, this was a popular thing. But what Severdine does is he takes a genre, which we see a lot of pictures of. So these were pictures which would have been photographed not just by um, Western tourists visiting and making their own photographs, but of course purchased by them. And as I mentioned before, a lot of those photographers, um, particularly in the Ottoman Empire, were, uh, were Armenian. Um, so they would have been purchasing from these, uh, you know, Armenian photographers. Um, and they also... Um, you know, so they would have been buying these specific scenes. But what Severdine does that I think really works well here is that he draws you in in a way that you don't necessarily get with all the other photographs. Now, that's not to say that those photographs themselves are also not wonderful because they are. But this gives you a different feeling. This gives you a sense that you know these people, that even though they're wearing clothes that, you know, particularly now we see as being something completely else, we feel like we sort of know them. They're, they're, they, they create this idea that, you start thinking about what is their story, right? And I think it's really, and as I say, I'm not a professional photographer, but you know, what really struck me and you know, one of the reasons, as I say, that I really wanted Carissa to be involved in this publication was because I knew he was doing things. I just didn't know what he was doing exactly. And so it meant that you know, I, I knew he was making the space appear to draw me in and making me feel a part of their lives but I had no idea how he was doing this. So perhaps Carissa, you could speak a little bit about how he was doing this. Yes, I would love to. Um, just to go through each of these photos briefly and allude to some of the compositional techniques I referred to earlier. On the left, it's really, um, uh, the use of props here is, is really well structured in a way that kind of pulls your eye up to that third focal point of the rule of thirds on the right and then pulls it up to another focal point on the left and kind of creates a triangle between the man's hand and then back up the the prop the rifle to that point and back around and it creates a triangle of movement around his face um, which is is a really interesting way to compose that image the second image, again, we have some more curved lines and implied lines within this tree that he's using to kind of frame a, a rule of thirds focal point um, and create some more movement. The branches especially kind of reaching towards the subject on the left and then hurricane bringing your eye back down to the bottom and again around through the photo. Same thing with the third image, the woman's face is the focal point and the way that she's holding her child and the way that that child um, is curved up towards her, it provides another circle of, of interest. On the, the far right, 
you've you've got a lot of beautiful filling of frame. He's pushing both of the subjects towards the edge of his composition and allowing the negative space in the background to kind of fill in um, what would otherwise maybe be busy or detract from the subjects in the foreground. And you have another triangle of interest there between the two adults' faces and where they are touching um, with their, I believe it's their knees that are, are next to each other. That triangle of interest kind of pulls your eye through the photograph yet again. Yeah, and this picture in particular, I found very striking uh, when I first saw it. It was actually, I did a short article on uh, on Antoine Severgin a couple of years ago for the Oriental Institute News and Notes publication. And this went on the cover because I thought, you know, this picture is amazing. Um, because although their faces are obscured and obviously, you know, now we may see these pictures and think differently than we than we used to uh, about that, because obviously, you know, now, we're, you know, the idea of people covering their faces in, on a daily basis is perhaps not so uh, surprising. So so in a way, they're less distant from us than they perhaps were even even about a year and a half ago. Um, it's the way they look at you so directly, that I think just absolutely you know as i say you feel like you want to talk to them you feel like they're going to talk to you actually and again uh chris so perhaps you could talk about like what is he doing that that achieves this here mm -hmm. i uh, i just love his work so much um he he has two focal points in this image with both of the women's faces placed at the those rule of third points and it creates this really um, incredible tension because your eye, if there's one focal point, it's much easier for your eye to kind of travel to that location and then get kind of lost in the story. And it, it creates kind of a relaxed, interesting experience as you look at a, a photograph. But when you have these two women who are looking directly into the camera and they're both placed on equal focal points, it's striking. Um, and again, he does such a good job of revealing by, um, by uh, obscuring and the costumes or or wear um whether it was their their own wear or it was something that he gave them to wear the way that he highlighted the costumes really makes you wonder i want to know who these people are i want to know what their story is and um they're full on straight towards the camera so you can you can see it in full but you you don't know what all is there and you don't know what their story is. So that again, creates kind of a, a mystery and, and tension and makes you want to know more about it and become interested in what he's doing. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, we've been looking a lot about at ethnographic portraits. So these are of course pictures which would have been taken of people who are supposed to be of that ethnicity of that religion in order to sort of form cabinet photographs that would have been collected by uh, by, as I say, both uh, Western European and North American collectors, as well as uh, Russian collectors for that matter. And also um, the local Iranian population purchased these as well. But in addition to that, so this is not in the OI collection. This is, this is from the Women's Worlds of Qajar Iran website. Um, he also did studio photography. Um, and so these were pictures which would not have circulated. Um, and this was an aspect that I was able to explore in the catalog in uh, some detail. And I know also Paulina looked at what kind of card this was. So perhaps you can talk about what this was, Paulina, and then I can talk a little bit about this woman and sort of we can look at some other things about her. Sure, Tasha. So this particular type of portraiture, the so-called cartes de visite, or small portraits printed on a piece of card, were extremely popular among the locals due to their cheap production cost. Uh, the cards were easy to produce in large quantities, and they were popular souvenirs for travelers from Russia and Europe, as Tasha already mentioned. One of the first photo studios that Dmitry Yermakov opened in Belisi, the photo studio photography by artist Kolchin and Yermakov, was specializing in the production of this type of cards to visit. Yeah, so of course, Severgin would have learned from Ermakov the importance of these photographs, and more importantly, um, as I'm sure we can all imagine, you know, obviously, he's having to make his living by this. And tourists are, 
you know, not necessarily reliable, don't always come all the time. And obviously you want to have this connection within your local community, in this case, the, uh, the Armenian Iranian community who he was photo photographing. So this is Hrypsima Abrahamian, uh, as you can see from her, this is her visiting card. So she not only had her portrait taken, but also had a card as you see in Armenian and uh, herself in French. So she's choosing two languages here. And we know it's by Severgin because he gives his name here spelled with E's on the end. So very much in the French style because this was considered what was most, you know, France was French was the language of art, was the language of culture. And so that's what he would have been using. And you can tell that this would not have been a picture that would have circulated. So this is not something that we're going to find in the museums of Europe and the US. I mean, the Severgain pictures we have in the OI collection there are parallels to those in multiple collections because those were the things people bought. And we know that this wouldn't have circulated precisely because, you know, she's wearing this early 20th century costume. This is very clearly a private picture that she would have used to give to her friends uh, and family. And perhaps, Carissa, you could talk a little bit about the technique that he was using uh, here in terms of the studio pictures. Yes, as you can see, he's using Rembrandt lighting to create some dimension on the face, which is also at one of those rule of third focal points. Um, from that focal point, he uses her sash to let your eye kind of travel down in a diagonal line towards her dress train, which also kind of lands in the secondary focal point. And so you have, even in this very... Um, simple photo of one person, you have movement and you have direction and you have some really wonderfully curated lighting. Yeah. So one of the things I'm going to be talking about shortly, um, but before I do, I just want to warn uh, those of you who might be sensitive. Uh, so the next two pictures, and I'll tell you when we're about to go to the photo and then the next two slides, and then when we're done with them, the next two pictures are going to contain pictures of deceased individuals. The first uh, slide will be of a, we'll have a picture of a deceased child in a coffin. And the second we'll have pictures of two older deceased individuals also in coffins. So I just want to warn anyone who might be sensitive and want to look away. Uh, this was part of what I actually talked about in one of my uh, articles on Severgain when I talked about her from Abrahamian and another photograph that Severgain did of her. And I really wanted to show these to you because it really shows Severgain's genius at creating these private pictures, pictures that he never intended that anyone else should see outside the family, we, we would presume. So I'm going to now go on to the next picture. So as I say, for those of you who might have concerns about this, please uh, look away. Right. So this is a photograph of Hripsima again. Uh, and you can see uh, from the early 20th century from her outfit. And you can see her here in the close up. You can see her in the picture here. And one of the things with this picture, um, despite the extremely sad content, is really how she is depicted, how she stands out. In fact, the first time I saw this photograph, I'll be honest, I didn't notice that there was a child in a coffin. I just saw her. And then I was like, wait, what is she doing? And then I looked and I'm like, oh, what, what is happening here? And you know, one of the things for those of you who may know about this genre of photography, uh, mortuary photography was very popular in uh, Western Europe and the United States. I immediately asked Pauline after I found this picture, I said, did they do mortuary photography in the Russian empire? And she said, no, uh, this was not something that they did. So this is no, no relationship to his work in the uh, Caucasus and his studies with Ermakov and Kolchin. Um, but Randler seems to have been inspired, as I say, by, um, by, uh, Mm, by this sort of genre of photography, which became very popular, but is very different. If those of you who are familiar with mortuary photography, or if you decide after this, you wish to explore the mm, interesting world of mortuary photography uh, from this period, you will discover that there, these, these pictures are very different. These pictures are done as a social, they're, they're done for, for social reasons, and the mourners are very important and this kind of thing. And this was a specialty uh, that seems to have been something that happened in uh, the Ottoman Empire amongst the Armenian community, does not seem to have spread to other communities, primarily in Eastern, uh, what is now Eastern Turkey. So the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Armenian communities living there. And it seems to have directly inspired the few examples that we have in, uh, in uh, basically in, in, in Iran. And so, I wondered if, Carissa, you could talk a little bit about this picture and why it's so striking, because it, it is. It's, it's, to my mind, it's an amazing picture. As I say, I'm 
unfortunately not in our collection, but it is an amazing photograph. Most definitely. This is one of the most impressive photos I think I've seen of, of his. Um, part of the reason why I do photography is because I get to capture what we love and what we grieve and what matters. And the way that he has captured grief and honored grief in this photo is really special and something that, that I don't see with a lot of other mortuary photography. Um, in a lot of other mortuary photography, most of the guests are all grouped together in one bunch and looking straight at the camera. Whereas in this photograph, he's placed them kind of in a, a circle around the deceased child. And the only person looking into the camera is her ipsma. And she's, you can tell her body is grief stricken. She's also the only one in, um, in full black clothing. And so she sticks out visually because of the, the contrast there, but also because of the posing. And again, Severgeen is revealing by obscuring and has turned the, um, the deceased child slightly away from the camera rather than straight on, allowing for a bit of, of honoring and that this is a a sacred and, and kind of a, a private though shared thing. And um, there's even within the photo, there's movement. If you start with the child's face and go down the uh, coffin up towards the girl on the very left, and then your eye travels through the sea of faces and goes back down to this little boy on the right who has a jacket that creates a triangle that creates an implied line back to um, the deceased child's face. So there's movement within this photo. The main focal point is, is obviously her and her grief and, um, and how much you're forced to reckon with that in viewing this photo. But uh, there's also still a lot of subtle movement and um, specific posing used to, to really honor what was happening. Right. And then we'll just go to the photos that Carissa was talking about where the people are posed very differently. So just as I say, uh, we'll be looking at another picture this time with two older individuals in uh, in coffins. So these are from the Ottoman Empire. So this is uh, the Ar um, Armenian community in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so in what is now Eastern Turkey, and you can see a very different kind of picture, very full there, as Carissa mentioned, they're looking at you straight on. So it's a very, you don't get the palpable grief that you get in the Severgeen uh, picture, I think. Now, we have a lot of portraits. So these are all from the OI collection. Uh, so of course we have a lot of these ethnographic photographs uh, that we have. And so one of the things, you know, we've been talking a lot about photographic techniques and, you know, sort of what Severgeen was trying to do and, you know, what I was trying to think. And then the question is, okay, so we know all of this. So where did this come from? Did he have uh, inspiration from his teachers, uh, Colchin, Ermakov, and Tbilisi in general. So perhaps, Paulina, you'd like to speak to this now. Sure. First, I would like to give a little context on the appearance and the spread of ethnographical images in the region. In accordance with European colonization practices, the Russian Empire began scientific exploration of the Caucasus shortly after the establishment of Caucasus governate. The study of the region was supposed to introduce the Caucasus and resources to the government and its subject, and most importantly, to support its status as a part of the Russian Empire. The first geographical ethnographical expedition to the Caucasus began in the 50s, and the leading role in the organization was played by the Imperial Geographic Society. The mission of the society was to collect and study the geography, history, and ethnology of the different regions of the vast territory of the Russian Empire. Among its first members were geographers, linguists, historians, ethnographers, artists, and military topographers. You might think that military topographer may sound like an interesting addition to the scientific expedition, but in reality is one of one of the first profession of the time to use photo cameras to create the accurate records of the landscape for the creation of maps. The appearance of those first depiction of locals, villagers, and city inhabitants occurred in the Russian Empire around the end of 18th century with so-called atlases of the empire. Later, the similar drawings of local population were produced separately and published in the scientific publication of its time. As you see here, those drawings would draw attention to the clothes, hairstyle, and the physical appearance of the depicted subject to demonstrate the difference from those who lived in Central Russia. The production of similar ethnographical photos for sale was also a part of Dmitry Makov's business strategy. Next slide, please. 
in the opposition of this approach to the depiction of locals, Antoine Sibrugin actively applied principles of the realistic genre in his photographic work. It's especially noticeable here in his portraits of street scenes and portraits of dervishes, where he concentrated on telling a story and reflecting the psychological condition of the character. Despite the fact that the majority of Sibrugin's portraits of locals taken on the street of Turin were produced as ethnographical illustration, his approach to the topic and models was first and foremost artistic. Next slide, please. The development and the growing population of realism in the region naturally supported the growth of photography and provided new ways for early photographers to represent their subjects. Built in upon the work and under instruction of early pioneers like Dmitry Yermakov, and within the context of cultural and artistic trends forwarded by the Russian Empire in the region, Anton Sibrugin expanded upon local photography as a both an ethnographic tool and an art form. Right. So one of the things I think that we see when we look at Severgin, you know, that really strikes me always is his ability to use outdoor space. So, and his also his ability to compose a scene. So what you may not realize here is this looks like he's standing in a crowd and, you know, there's happens to be an ice cream seller selling ice cream to all these happy people eating ice cream. Uh, however, this is not at, at all what it appears to be. So while these individuals may have genuinely been ice cream sellers and their customers, um, this is actually photographed on the parade ground, the drill ground uh, in Tehran. So this is this giant, uh, you know, basically field where, you know, they would do parading and things like this. So this is, you know, so it's, it's actually empty, probably. There's probably nobody behind him, nobody on either side of them. But yet, Severgin makes it look like there is. And the other thing that I think is interesting with what he does is, and speaking as someone who is not a fan of empty space, um, he actually uses empty space to his own advantage and isn't afraid to use it. And I greatly admire him for that because this would not be something I would be able to do. But yet, as we see, the, there's nothing in the background, essentially. I mean, you can kind of see that something's there, but it really just sort of vanishes. Again, creating this view of space and size. And perhaps, Carissa, you'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, his, what, you know, what he's able to do here, photographically speaking. Yeah, I think this photo is absolutely incredible. The, um, the main focal point is the one subject who's the only one who's looking directly into the camera, who is the smallest, who's the only girl who has the least power, probably out of, out of anyone in this, in this photo. She's also, her face is, is the uh, darkest exposure so that you can see the details on her face the most clearly. So um, when I look at this photo, I immediately see her and that's where my eye goes. The way that he used the people and posed the people around her is really interesting as well. Um, if you kind of pay attention to the head directions and the uh, placement of heads and and uh, see where people are looking and what implied lines might be there. It creates a bit of an infinity symbol from the little girl's face around to the right, where the two heads on the right are, down to the cartwheels, back up and back around and creates a lot of movement. So you have some interesting dynamics there with movement. You've also got the, uh, as Tasha mentioned, the negative space in the background uh, used also in a way that creates a, a rule of thirds. You've got the horizon line at uh, one of those placements, and then you've got basically where people are standing as, as another one of those lines. He's filling the space um, with people's bodies on the left and even cutting somebody off just a little bit to kind of provide a little bit of tension. Um, but again, using a cart as a, as a means to reveal. He's obscuring the little girl who is the main focal point, and yet it's adding more interest, and it's, it's maybe even adding a bit more context to her story, and um, I, just, I just love everything about this photo. Even the gentleman who is fifth from the left, the way that he's posed with his hands underneath his face and the way that his his hat and his face and his hands create a bit of a triangle that that also, again, creates an implied line towards that little girl is um, really beautiful. There are so many beautiful things happening in this photograph that I could talk about for a very long time, but I will not. <laughs> yeah, you're not the only one. I, I, I remember when I first saw this picture and I was like, I don't know what's going on here, but just amazing. 
Um, so perhaps Paulina, you'd like to talk a little bit about sort of how he's getting inspiration for scenes like these. Sure. In, in general, the self-representation of Antoine Sibrugin as an artistic photographer is mostly noticeable in his depiction of social outdoor scene, where he tends to use the realistic genre the most. The realism with the, its importance on the true representation of the subject and almost ethnographical interest in the details certainly affected the way in which the Caucasus were represented in paintings and photography in the 60s and 70s, the time that Antoine Sebrugin would receive his informal art education in BDC. The widespread popularity of realism in the Russian art of the second half of the 19th century was mainly due to the work of Peridvishniki or the Wanderers, a group of realistic artists who left the Academy of Art in protest of its outdated, in their opinion, academic principle of education. As a result of their protest, they founded a cooperative of artists whose main mission was to promote the realistic genre. The art activities of the group included the organization of annual exhibitions in St. Petersburg and Moscow, which were widely covered in newspapers across the nation. Next slide, please. The subject of their paintings ranged from landscape of the changing season to portraits reflecting the psychological condition of the characters to social genre seen with a special attention given to the lives of peasants, city workers, and the middle class. The interest in the depiction of common people helped foster the development of ethnographical painting in the same period. Next slide, please. As photography spread throughout the region without established standards for medium, early photographers employed all manners of style and subjects. However, as previously mentioned, close collaboration between early photographers and artists at the time, combined with the overall interest in the exploration of the Caucasus and nearby territories, led to the general prominence of the three main genre in the local photography. It will be landscape, social scenes, and portraits. Those same genres were actively promoted by Russian realism in the second half of the 19th century and were widely developed in ethnographic art. Yeah, so one of the things that hasn't gotten as much attention really first from ever, so we're, we've, we've been looking a lot about his outdoor scenes, his portraits, which are, yeah, perhaps the things for which he is the most famous. We've also been looking at his studio pictures, which didn't circulate as widely as, as we've noted. Uh, but also another thing that he's known for is his landscapes. I mean, it hasn't, as I say, gotten as much attention, uh, but I do think that um, it's one of these things where, uh, you know, the you can still see what he's trying to do and what he is doing is very impressive. And so just as he spends a lot of time putting together and composing, because it's clearly that he did spend a lot of time putting his pictures together and composing them and yet making sure that everybody appeared natural, which I cannot imagine was an easy thing to do. He clearly also spent a lot of time thinking about how to put together his pictures of landscapes uh, and also of uh, monuments, uh, such as what we can see here. And again, just as we've seen with his pictures of, uh, of you know, basically of, of people, or people within places, we can see here how he's paid a lot of attention. And again, I'm not the photographer, but he's paid a lot of attention to how he composes this, right? This is not just someone who showed up and took a picture, a la what most of us do, right, when we're on holiday. And therefore, what this means is that monuments that people would have been familiar with, because in Iran, basically tourists would visit a certain tourist track right? So there were certain monuments that you would go to, and then you would either photograph them yourself, or you would then buy pictures from someone like Severgain, probably from Severgain, since he seems to be the most common person who supplied foreign tourists with their, uh, with their pictures. Um, and so as a result, um, it's one of these things where uh, he makes it special. Right. So so I mean, this monument may be photographed by a bunch of other people. And as we'll see shortly, we can see a real contrast with that. But this is striking. Right. You want to go and see these places because you're like, wow, this is an amazing thing. And what Severgin did when he went throughout Iran was he did photograph all of these monuments. It's also the case that his pictures were taken by tourists and also scholars uh, and used by them, not always, unfortunately, crediting him. Uh, so perhaps. Oops, sorry. Uh, perhaps uh, Carissa could talk a little bit about what he's doing in these pictures. 
I really love his use of leading lines when it comes to landscape and monument photography. Um, there's also, especially with these two images, there's a really beautiful use of negative space. On the left, the mountain in the background, it's just clipped at the very top to kind of create um, or emphasize the grandeur. Um, there's not a ton of negative space above the mountain that would lead you to believe that there's a lot of space there. It, it fills the frame. It, it's, it's a bit overwhelming. Same with the image on the right. There's only a tiny little bit of negative space at the very top that, that adds to how, how big and looming this structure is. Um, there are horizontal lines in this, such as on the right, that kind of provide some calm. And then on the left, there are a lot of diagonal lines that create movement and interest. If you just follow your eye down the sides of the mountain and through the village, there's a lot of um, kind of a zigzag pattern where he oriented the camera in a way that, that kind of lets your eye continue to go back up and down the image. Um, there's curved lines in there and vertical lines, and there's more information that I've placed there on specific leading lines. But one other thing that I'd like to talk about with the image on the right is that he knows also when to break rules uh, of photography. And one of those rules is the rule of thirds. He's placed the uh, monument right there, smack dab in the middle, and you're confronted with how overwhelming it is. It's, it's almost a bit uncomfortable. And I think um, his use of the rules of photography, as well as his occasional breaking of the rules, really speaks to how well he knew these rules and how well how well to use them. Yeah, and I think when we contrast Severdeen's uh, material with a monument, basically it's the same shot of, of, of several decades apart, we can get a sense of how he's doing something that's different. Right. So his photograph, which is the one of the OI photographs, is on the on the left. And you can see, I mean, this was again a photograph I found to be very striking. Um, you know, just just looking at it, you know, and I initially I was like, where is this exactly? And you know, it's the Blue Mosque in Tabriz, which of course uh is a you know a very famous monument now in ruins. And if you contrast it with the picture that's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art that may be by Luigi Pesci, who was the first uh, photographer to take photographs in Iran, uh, he was Italian, you can see the difference, right? Even though it's faded for one thing, which doesn't help, but nevertheless, you can see how what Severgin is doing achieves a much different effect. Now, I'm not saying so that that's good or bad, it's just different. And perhaps uh, Carissa could talk a little bit about why the, the Severgin picture seems so much different than the Pesci picture, even though they're really not that different, actually. Yeah, it's kind of incredible. On the, on the left, the, the monument, again, spills out over the edge of the frame, a, a, a technique he used in the previous picture of the mountain, kind of adding to the grandeur, using that negative space, using the positive space to emphasize how big this monument is and how looming it feels. We're on the right, the negative space above the monument isn't really doing a lot. You've captured the image, but it's not adding to the story of the monument. It's not adding to the, the artistry of how overwhelming that monument might feel. Um, additionally, Severgin was very mindful of the shadows in his, comp in his composition. On the right, the shadows don't really create leading lines. Um, there's not a lot that they add to the image. Whereas on the left, the biggest shadow is a diagonal shadow that that goes from the the middle of the right corner down to a, a kind of a, a secondary focal point within that image, creating a, a bit more movement to something that might not have a lot of, of movement um, and creates more, more dimension. So there's a lot going on in this with him filling the frame, using negative space, using positive space, using implied diagonal lines. Yeah, and perhaps Paulina, you could talk about how you know he may have been inspired to do this sort of artistic photography uh, thanks to his training as an artist in the uh, in the Russian Empire in in Tbilisi. Sure, the romanticization of nature and the inhabitants of the Caucasus was particular to the Russian artists who traveled in the region in 1830s, 40s, and 50s. Most paintings on the time will depict breathtaking views of mountain ranges, ancient fortresses, churches, and panoramas of cities and ports. The landscape produced by Russian artists 
in the Caucasus were often reproduced in lithography and published in numerous research publications, as well as in formal panoramic view and cityscape albums. Next slide, please. Those albums with landscapes and scenes of local life became an important tool in introduction and popularization of the Caucasus to the rest of the Russian Empire. Wherefore, the growing popularity of those same subjects in early photography in the region grew from the well-spread tradition of lithography in the first half of 19th century and the demand of the audience to see those relatively well-known views of local nature and life. Yeah, so what we're trying really to do today through some of the uh, talking about sort of my feelings and research on Severgin's pictures, as well as uh, Paulina and Carissa's, was so that we can better understand, you know, I think Severgin's photography and also I think appreciate it. I have to say, after I read uh, Carissa's uh, piece for the first time, I suddenly began to understand why did I feel the way I felt when I looked at Severgin's pictures, and just as after I read Paulina's contribution, seeing how his artistic vision took form or could have taken form. And so, you know, it's really something that we were very uh, fortunate to do. And as I mentioned, there's an online version of the catalog. So for those of you who can't, uh, and not just the catalog, but also the exhibition, uh, for those of you who can't come to Chicago for various reasons at the moment, uh, you can actually see the entire exhibition uh, online uh, and all of the information and everything like that. And I just wanted to conclude by thanking everyone who contributed for the catalog, uh, obviously the Knights of Artan Fund for Armenian Studies and the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser, the American Institute of Iranian Studies and the Dora Laura Zorab Liebman Fund. I would like to thank you all for this opportunity to talk and I'm happy and I know my colleagues are as well, to answer some questions about this or other aspects of Severgain's work. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for, for the presentation and for uh, leading us through uh, some of these photographs and uh, not only showing us, but also showing how we see what we see uh, and uh, wonderful uh, and, and informative for, for all of us. There are a few questions I would like to uh, ask. Um, can you uh, discuss the uh, use of um, color or, or of uh, non-black and whiteness in, in these photographs and how this was achieved? And uh, from the same questioner also, since the uh, the, the, the Institute is a center of photograph uh, restoration. Have any of Zavrugin's uh, works been uh, restored or in need of restoration uh, treatment at, at, the, at the Institute for anyone who wishes to answer? Thank you. Right, so I'll start and then I may ask Carissa to weigh in on the color uh, issue. Uh, but yeah, so it's very interesting you bring that up because that was actually one of the aspects of the catalog that we uh, that uh, we looked at and we actually did a colorization. So the two women with the face veils who you saw, there's also another picture of them in our collection which uh, shows them with two men, perhaps their husbands, brothers, not really clear who. Anyway, we actually did a full, uh, we did we did a, a basically Josh Toulousiak who works in the prep shop. Uh, we did a, uh, he basically put it through Photoshop and colorized it because I was very interested in this whole question of, you know, we see Severgain so much in black and white, just as we see so many of these photographers in black and white, because that was pretty much what there was, although there was the possibility to take color photographs. Uh, Prokud and Gorsky at the beginning of the 20th century did that throughout the Russian empire. Um, and so we actually, for the, in the exhibition, there's actually, we, we, we had uh, they printed out the prep shop did this giant picture of the of the colorized severgain and put it on the wall to give people a sense of what this would be like because i did want to remind people that it's you know, it's not the whole story, right? This is just giving us a part of it. So when we look at the costumes, when we look at all of this, we're just seeing it. When we look at the monuments, we only see it in these sort of different shades of, I guess perhaps Carissa can speak to this, the exact color coloring that he's doing and how he's trying to manipulate what is a very limited color palette. Yes, um, so just to clarify, all of the images that we have of uh, taken by Severgin are originally taken in black and white, but that process of using albumin 
printing with that egg wash on paper is what uh, the egg wash itself ages. When it ages, it, it turns that yellowish color. And so that's where you're getting the yellows and you're getting those kind of hues in those photographs. So um, that's a, a byproduct of the, the printing as far as the the colorizing images that Tasha spoke to, um, it's kind of a, a neat thing to do in the way that technology has has allowed us to be able to figure out, oh, this was maybe a green dress or a red dress and why we would know there's a, that's a whole nother topic, but um, the album in itself continues to yellow as it, as it ages. Yeah, and I think you see sort of these gradations of gray that he's able to manipulate very, I think, skillfully. So yeah, it's, it's a black and white image and yet, it's very dynamic because he's using shadow, I think, so expertly. And and would he, uh, at the time when he was taking the images, have been aware of this aging process and and have factored that into his composition? Do you, do you suppose? I think so. And the reason I say I think so is people did know that this was what happened. This is this is because it's so common in album imprints. And indeed, one of the things Pumdi was asking about conservation. So we were very fortunate to uh, get a grant from the American Institute of Iranian Studies to actually conserve all all of the prints. So we have 152 original album imprints in one copy and the 152 have now all been conserved. And that's basically, they were cleaned, they were rehoused and some of them, the now con conserved prints are on display. And so that means that basically, uh, yeah, they're now in the best condition that they can be. They were, they're not in an album. So they're on loose pieces of cardboard and that cardboard has somewhat, mm, you know, warped through time, but you had to do that because the album and the paper was so thin. So you had to immediately stick it down on something. If you didn't, it would have curled up. But yeah, I think he knew that it would change color because it's funny when I look at Severgain pictures, you know, I often will see that many of them have this same colorization. Now, those of you who are familiar with the first Sackler collection, which has the, probably the largest collection uh, of uh, Severdine pictures, will know that there's he had there are glass slides there. And some of them you saw in this presentation, the really super sharp black and white images. Uh, and so you can see there, you know, what it would have originally been looking like. But yeah, I think he knew because he was certainly someone who seemed to have planned everything. So I'm convinced he also planned for sort of the afterlife of his pictures and what would have happened to them. Yes. Thank you. Can you, what can you tell us about the numbers that appear on the photographs? Someone with very good eyes uh, asks. Yes, having spent much time with these numbers, and uh, Carissa will know because we had to, to laboriously enter them all in. Um, so basically, this was a common technique. People would sign their negatives with number systems. Ermakov used this as well. Uh, so this was something that the Russian photographers used. Uh, not every photographer did this, and Severgin doesn't put a number on every picture. But basically, you'll see numbers. Some, And so basically, these are his negative numbers. Now, Sometimes there's more than one number. And the other thing that he does is sometimes you have the same picture and different negative numbers. So clearly he had multiple copies, which you could do uh, with glass slides. And then the other thing that he does that distinguishes him from people like Ermakov is that he hides his numbers. And so you'll often see that his numbers are stuck like on a haystack or they're stuck like, you know, they're stuck in a, in a not very obvious place. So he wants to have them, but he doesn't necessarily want them to take over because some of the Ermakov pictures you'll see, Ermakov actually does do that to the point where you're, you're kind of distracted, I think. And so it's sometimes can be quite hard to find. Uh, there, were, there were ones that I actually missed the first time I went through them. Uh, and, and actually, because he, he so artfully hides them, like everything he does. And in the pictures where... So I mentioned that his uh, some of his work was not credited to him. And so Herzfeld and Saar, who were uh, German scholars who did not credit Severdine after having him take pictures of Persepolis for them, they actually published the pictures without the negative numbers. Now, whether presumably he gave them to them without them, but you can see the advantage of having your negative number on it because you know, I, I was quite fascinated because we have one of the pictures that Herzfeld and Saar publish as being, public, being photographed by Saar. And so I immediately compared them and the negative number was not there. And I thought, oh, how interesting. So again, it kind of acts as a signature because none of the pictures in the collection were known to be by Severgin. I figured that out. 
So it was one of these things where when they were given, the woman, Mary Clark, the Protestant missionary was like, well, here's some pictures. Mm. And, um, you know, I think she went to Severdeen's studio. As she worked in uh, various schools in both Tabriz and Tehran. So she would have probably known the Armenian community, as we know, these Protestant missionary schools were uh, trying to convert uh, both Armenians and uh, and Assyrians to, you know, Protestantism. And so I think she would have probably had quite an, potentially quite an involvement with the Armenian community, at least the ones who were attending the school. And presume, and of course, Severdeen was the person that you would go to in any case. Um, but it's one of these things where she never says. She's just like photos of Iran. Uh, so it was one of these things that when I saw the pictures and I started to realize these are special pictures um, because before I knew who they were by. And then I read something where someone said, oh, actually, they're by Severed Game. There was like a one line thing where someone said this. And then I thought, oh, of course, of course, it's Severed Game. Now all is all is clear. So it, it's one of these things where having negative numbers is very beneficial, even if we don't always know what they mean. What can you tell us about uh, Severgin's family and, and descendants, especially those who were uh, also engaged in, in artistic ventures? Yeah, so Severgin's family, um, so first his father, uh, so maybe Paulina, you want to talk a little bit about his father, first of all, and then we'll talk about him and his, de and his descendants. Oh, yeah. So Vasily Severigin, his father, uh, he was a part of the Armenian community in Moscow, and he attended Lazarev Institute of Oriental Studies. That was like kind of a center for the Armenian community there. And uh, he graduated from this Lazarev Institute that by the time that he graduated, it was already the Institute of Oriental Languages, such as Arabic, Turkish, and so on. So a lot of graduates of the Lazarev Institute were um, becoming the diplomats and they were sent to different areas like to Persia, that's how Vasily Serbian got to Tehran or other regions. And they were kind of like representative of the Russian empire there. Yeah, and what's interesting is that, of course, people look at Severgin's name and they're like, well, but this doesn't look particularly Armenian necessarily. And of course, originally it was Severugian and then they Frenchified it to make it sound more yeah, this was something, I mean, you actually saw Ivazovsky's paintings Paulina was showing. He's also Armenian. He's Armenian from the Crimea. Um, and again, it's not going by, you know, a necessarily hugely recognizable Armenian name. And I think it's also interesting that Severgin, uh, he, in addition to this, he actually, his family, and they were Russian Orthodox. So this was quite common that uh, Armenians working for the Russian Empire and the Russian Empire was very keen on using Armenians as part of the, I mean, it sounds sort of ironic to say this, but the Russification process of uh, colonization were in fact, uh, would convert to Russian Orthodox. And so his family in their uh, burials, and this has been documented by Stacey Shywiller, uh, they're actually buried in the Russian section in Tehran. So his wife's tomb, even though his wife is a member of the Armenian Iranian community and potentially didn't actually speak Russian, it's hard to tell. Um, she uh, she actually has a Russian gravestone, and so does his, you know, and this kind of thing. So there's this whole sort of very interesting thing as far as his family. So his his daughter, uh, one of his daughters, actually assisted him in his studio, and she took her own pictures. We I don't know very much about her, unfortunately. I've been trying to find out more, um, but she actually ran the studio after he died of kidney failure in 1933. Um, so she kept it going for a while. Um, I his brothers seem to have, several of his brothers seem to have assisted him, as did other members of his family. We presume. Um, as I say, his wife comes from a, uh, a Armenian Iranian uh, family in Tehran. And uh, Tehran in this period was a huge growing city. Obviously, the biggest communities of Armenians in Iran were in Tabriz and in uh, New Jolfa, the suburb of Isfahan. Uh, but there were, because Tehran was growing so much, there were a lot of Armenians moving to this new city. So yeah, one of his sons becomes a very talented artist. Um, and so it's clear that the family continues this tradition of photography, of art. And uh, I have looked in vain for draw, uh, drawings or paintings by Severdeen, which would be very interesting to compare not only to his son's work, but also to uh, 
uh, his painting, but uh, unfortunately we don't have that uh, for him. We do for Gabriel Lekedjian, who's an Armenian artist uh, from and photographer who was born in Constantinople, but then uh, worked ended up working in Cairo. So for him, we do have both his paintings and his uh, photographs, but not for uh, Severgin, unfortunately. But it's clear this was a very artistic, uh, very talented family. The father, the son, his brothers, his children, you know, all of this. Thank you. Uh, did did he take any photos in uh, Agulis uh, where he had spent his youth? And, and in fact, we were discussing this a little bit before the program. Uh, this takes on uh, ad additional poignancy uh, because of the erasure of the Armenian cultural heritage in, in Agulis and in Nakhchivan in its entirety uh, by, by the government of Azerbaijan. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, in the and, and for centuries, of course, Agulis was a large, uh, had a very large and very vibrant and prosperous uh, Armenian uh, community of which presumably uh, Severdin's mother and perhaps his father, we're not really sure, uh, was also part of and presumably he had family who were living there that they lived with at this point. Uh, there, as far as uh, I'm aware, you know, Severgin's pictures seem to, at least the ones we can attribute to him, seem to have really started once he got to Iran. Now, presumably he assisted Ermakov. Um, I'm not actually sure if Ermakov took pictures of Agulis, so I, I would not be surprised. Ermakov's work, which, you know, presumably Severgin would have assisted with, he, um, he actually took, we, and we have, thousands and thousands of his pictures, which have not been fully studied yet. These are mostly in Tbilisi in Georgia. Um, obviously, there's certain monuments in Agulis that uh, certain Armenian monuments in Agulis that I suspect that if uh, if 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 either Severgin or Ermakov had photographed that they would have photographed those monuments are extremely yeah, we, we know exactly what they look like, even though they no longer exist. Uh, and so they would be very identifiable. So it would be actually, and it's actually a really interesting idea because uh, I'm looking to go on to do more looking at this relationship with Ermakov and Severgin, which hopefully Paulina will continue to assist me with, uh, that we uh, could actually take a look and see. Now, I do know that Ermakov took a lot of pictures. He went to Armenia, took pictures of Armenians. There was a exhibition, I think in the 80s, uh, mm -hmm. a Russian exhibition that looked at that. So definitely, um, I would not be surprised if there were, and it would be very interesting because, yeah, as 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 we know, those monuments aren't there, and so this would be a very valuable and yet more valuable evidence for those monuments and buildings. Can you talk about the extent to which, uh, or the ways in which, um, Severgin staged his photographs? including the placement of or or not placement uh, depending on the situation of, of of humans within the frame uh when he was taking pictures of monuments the, how how composed are we to understand these images to be as opposed to you know uh simply taking a picture of of what was there uh randomly yeah it's a leading, it's a leading question obviously <laughs> Well, it's very interesting because he actually, and I'll turn it over to Chris in a second, but this is a very interesting question because, so in the chapter four of the catalog, I actually talk about this quite a lot with his picture, photographs of the monument of Pasargade, the tomb of Cyrus the Great in Iran, where he spends a lot of time either taking pictures with lots of people. So suddenly Pasargade, he does this with Persepolis also, where he takes photographs where there's tents in the background. So this, this is the expedition. So as Carissa was talking about, they had to come on horseback and then they, they camped in the, uh, in the Abadana, which is obviously not what you can do now. Uh, but he, he deliberately puts all these things in the frame. He wouldn't have to. He could photograph these things from other points of view. And he makes things like Pasargade, which is a monument that, you know, basically nobody was living there. But yet the way he does it, is he makes it look like it's part of the landscape in a living way that's a completely different way than anybody else photographed Pasargade, I might add, because people people love Pasargade and they photograph it almost identically or draw it, actually, for that matter, almost identically every time. Then in other cases, he takes people out, right? And so then they're not there. And so then it's like, well, what's he doing? Or he's doing things where he puts people in in very small sizes or things where you know he's clearly sort of 
trying to show them in ways that aren't just for scale. So sometimes they're there and, and they do seem to operate in sort of uh, as scale. But in other cases, it's clear they're doing something completely else. So it's sort of going beyond what you might call the typical monument photography. Um, Carissa, I don't know if you have any comments on this. Yeah, I think when I look at Severgain's photos, he was very intentional with whatever he did include and whatever he did not include. And um, so in and of itself, that's something to kind of consider looking through his photography and how he put people or placed people next to monuments. It could be the instant that there was somebody there as he was photographing that he maybe didn't intentionally place there. But it is also important to note that because of the nature of photography during the time and how long it took to expose a photograph, it would take a minimum of one to two minutes to actually capture that, that uh, negative glass plate image. And so he would have to be thinking about where to place his camera, what subjects are in front of his camera, what direction the light was coming, and really anticipate all of that because each of those photographs that he took on those glass plate negatives, it took a lot of time, it took a lot of investment, you had to be very intentional about it. Um, and also you're carrying these big glass plates with you out, out by horseback. You don't wanna waste any of those, they're really precious. And so I think, especially with some of the monument photographs where there are people that you can see in certain positions, it, it looks intentional and it looks like there are special leading lines and negative spaces and things like that. Um, and I think just the nature of the type of photography would have, have made it more intentional either way. Yeah, there's a few cases where he's taking outdoor photographs where it's clear he's taking photographs where the emphasis is on, say, the monument. So there's a picture that we have in the collection of the Gulistan Palace, where he does seem to have people kind of wandering into shot a bit. But even there, it seems like it's deliberate and he's waited until a particular moment to get what it is he wants and then he photographs it. So even in instances where he's maybe not completely in control of what they're doing, and you also wonder how much he's interacting because we have another picture in the collection where he's up high and he's looking down across a street with a bunch of people on it. And a bunch of those people are actually looking at him, like straight at him. When you look at the picture, you can see that. So it's like, is he talking to them? What is he doing? You know, are they just looking up at this strange thing that's happening up on the roof? You know, so there, I think there's a lot that's happening that it's clear he's a, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, and it's not for nothing that I have an art. One of my chapters is called intentionality. It has it has the word intentionality in it because he that is what he does. He intends everything he does, as I say, controlled, intentional, and yet natural all at once, which is why I think he's such a fantastic photographer. Question that uh, since not all of Ermakov's photos were actually taken by Ermakov, uh, are all Severugin photos taken by Severugin? I mean, you know, obviously when you're talking about a studio, um, presumably you have the person who is, and you saw it in the pictures, Severugin seems to have had an assistant and you see that person in the pictures. Now, whether this is his son or one of his brothers or who this is, it's clear that he has people helping. We heard already his daughter, as I mentioned, his daughter was involved in the business. so. He's definitely directing it, whether he's personally taking every single picture, that's not always clear um, in the sense that, you know, he could have, you know, been there and told, you know, whoever it was. But I think just the way that it is to do it, but he would have been involved. And, and I say that because of the way his pictures are so distinct. With Ermakov, you can see better that he sort of told whoever to go off and do whatever and perhaps was not as involved. But with Severgain, you really see that involved, his personal, I think, involvement in exactly what is going on, whether he's personally the one holding the glass negative or not. Thank you. Then uh, it, it remains for me to convey uh, actually the first comment, not a question, but a comment congratulating you. And I would like to join in congratulating all of you uh, on, on the catalog and, 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 and the, the person submitting this, this comment, who is a scholar, uh, commends you on your approach, which explores and reveals the many facets of his genius and his cosmopolitan identity, but equally important, his Armenian connection. So uh, I, I would second that uh, observation and sentiment. And, and uh, really, we've enjoyed tremendously hearing and seeing uh, the, the, about the work. 
and uh, look forward to more. And again, since I like to hold up books, uh, I want to show off this book and encourage people to to seek it out. Again, you can you can get it from the NASA bookstore, or you can download the PDF, or you can you can find it elsewhere on your own. Uh, but it's it's a wonderful accomplishment, and uh, it's both beautiful to look at and informative to read. So that's a great combination. Thank you all for your for your wonderful contributions to the book, to the exhibition, and to making this evening possible. So. Bravo and thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Really, it's as as you may gather, we're very we're all we're really enthusiastic to talk about this, and it's yeah, really, I, I wonder if, if you were. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> that very much comes across. Yes, thank you, and thank you everybody for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, and uh, 